Hey everybody, Joey Altruda here once again with another interview session, Q&A, back and forth and uh, meeting of minds, if you will. And uh, this is Roger Rivas. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Roger Rivas, a longtime friend of mine, musical cohort, a fantastic keyboardist and music producer. And we've known each other for, I don't know, maybe up to 20 years, even like peripherally, but we've been friends for a good solid 15, I think, uh, knowing each other. So it's a pleasure. Roger is primarily known as the organist of the Agrolites. Yeah. And well, here we are. We've known each other for a long time, but there's a lot of things we've never known about each other or thought about asking one another. So we figured it'd be good just to hang out and I don't know, shoot the breeze and see what's up. So here we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks for tuning in everybody. If you follow the channel, push like uh, or share or thumbs up, or how do you do it? Subscribe. Subscribe. Subscribe, like, share, and comment. That's it, because we really wanna get the YouTube channel flowing here as much as we can and get the word out to people that we're doing cool things here. Yes. So anyway, uh, Roger. Yes. I, I got a few just introductory questions. I don't have a list. Let's just go freestyle. You know, uh, I remember seeing you probably when the Agrilites first performed, well, got together, and they were playing at the Knitting Factory. So it would have had to have been around 2000, right? Yes, around there. That sounds right. And I mean, that, that's, that's mm, probably 2002, but I mean, just right yeah. around. Early days, though, right? The right, Knitting right. Factory in Los Angeles. Uh, was it a residency or no? It was Chris Murray's. Uh, what was the name of his night there? Oh, Monday Blue night? Beat Lounge. Blue Beat Lounge. And right. so you guys were there semi regularly, right? Yeah, kind of. I mean, we were just started. So Chris, you know, definitely gave us the opportunity. Obviously, he did it every Tuesday. So it was Tuesday. like, yeah. Okay. So it was like, come on in, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of cool. It's kind of like, you know, every band kind of has that spot where they uh, get to audition. I mean, it's a super new band at that moment. So we didn't even know each other all that well, you know, it was kind of just oh. kind of together. I um, didn't know that. I didn't yeah, know that. Oh, I think, I mean, Chris Murray has been on the scene for a long time and, you know, as a performer, singer, songwriter, and he promoted a night every Tuesday in LA at the Knitting Factory called Blue Beat Lounge. And it was kind of an institution in its own right. And it hosted a lot of bands. And what, one of the coolest aspects of it was, it was an all ages place, which is not easy to find in Los Angeles, okay? So people were really able to go and be with the music and you know that's that's like I say, it's it's not easy to find a place, let alone a regular spot in LA nightclub where kids can go and see it. So it was really good for the the ska scene and the revival of ska and early Jamaican sounds. You know, so uh, what what band were you in before Agrolites? I don't think I Rhythm Doctors. No, no. So the Rhythm Doctors. Still the Agrolites were like 50% Rhythm Doctors and 50% this band called The Vessels. And so when you talk about the music that we played and the kind of the music that brought us together, that commonality, it's this music label, the Skinhead Reggae, 1969, 1970, 68 kind of reggae, especially the reggae that, that um, was coming out of the UK. Jamaican yeah. immigrants were going to the UK, the working class, kind of started that subculture. So... Ladies and gentlemen, when you hear skinhead reggae, go to Wikipedia and check it out. It's a crazy story, but it's not what you think when you hear the word skinhead. So, yeah. so we were all very much into that music. It was a special time where you, it was still hard to find music. You know, um, you couldn't really just jump on the internet, jump on YouTube and find it. So when you knew people that were still collecting records um, or were collecting records, maybe however they got it i mean maybe at that point there was like mail order or some you know they knew someone but you gravitate towards them because it was like okay cool we're, we're, we're digging the same thing we're collecting the same baseball card kind of thing yeah um so those two bands that's the big thing that we shared is that we were trying to play 
music that was based around the upsetter sound or the hippie boys or um you know jackie matu a lot of organ uh, driven reggae mm -hmm. and before even you know vessels were, were after rhythm doctors like they we would see the rhythm doctors and be like wow they're like a kick-ass band but even before them a band called dynamic pressure i think deserves the credit and really coming out and saying look we're playing 1969 reggae the primary the, the primary instrument's going to be organ we're not going to have horns we're not really doing ska music and around that time I'm, when dynamic pressure was coming out they were doing it like in the whiskey at go go days you know with lewis and steady beat so they were really kind of starting something new in a world where everyone, where ska music was still new to a lot of people, where the ska boom hadn't happened, you know? Um, so when we happened in the early 2000s, 2002, something like that, it was, you know, kind of like the spark was dynamic pressure, went to Rhythm Doctors, went to Vessels, both bands had broken up. And then you kind of just, the guys that still had a passion for it, you know, ended up mm -hmm. meeting each other and uh, starting the Agrolytes. I see. So what year was Dynamic Pressure and who was in the band? So Dynamic Pressure was uh, good friends of, of, of the Agrolytes. When we first started out, I looked up to uh, Dan Bower, the organ player. I still do. He's a great organ player. Uh, Jubal Molitor was a bass player, great bass player. Zach Pike, a guitar player, amazing guitar player. Those three are the nucleus of the band and they are very, very, very talented in their own right. I think that it, the same thing kind of happened with them. Like they were homies uh, based out of Santa Barbara. I might be a little wrong, but I know it was uh, up north. They spent time in Hawaii. They weren't an LA band then. Not a Los Angeles band at all. Yeah, I don't remember and, them from LA, but what year were they around? Were they around while Jump With Joey was out on the scene in LA? Ah, uh, you know, it's hard. Okay, so Jump With Joey, you talked Jump With Joey. That was, I mean, Jump With Joey was one of the foundation Scott. came together in 89. Yeah, I would say with Dynamic Pressure, um, probably mid to late 90s, but nothing, because Agrolytes were like early 2000s. So Dynamic Pressure was, you know, playing, uh, I think there's some footage of them at the Whiskey Go Go, and that's probably like 98, 97. I see. But, but mm -hmm. nothing like early 90s or late 80s. No. Yeah. So they're more around your age group? Yeah, a little a little above, but definitely yeah. around the age group, yeah. yeah. I'm like a half a generation down from me. I'm 57. How old are you now? Have you hit 40 oh yet? God. I am 39, so 40 is around the corner, man. Next year is 40. 40. Uh, well, you look good for your age, Joey. Jeez, I, I didn't want to Thank come you. on you. 41 um, for the, for 40 for the first time, I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> You're turning 40 for the first time. What do you say? Like, um, when I turned 30... You know, a good friend of ours, Eric Kohler. Yeah. I, there's certain things that people say in your life and then they kind of just stick with you. And the one thing he said was, uh, when I turned 30, he goes, oh, dude, he goes, Roger, he goes, the 30s are going to be the best time of your life. Like, you're going to love it. Like, this is just be so stoked for this. And I look back and I go, okay, 30s were cool. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to complain. Yeah. But like, I'm waiting for someone, I don't care who it is, to come up and go, oh, you're going to be 40? Oh, your 40s are going to be way better than your 30s. Like, <laughs> Let me tell you, right. your 40s are going to be way better than your 30s because <laughs> you made that so in how you think right. and bring it to you. It's all about that. And uh, well, congratulations. And, you know, I remember when you, that, that would put you around... 2021 when you were playing with the agrolytes and i remember i knew brian dixon he was in the rhythm doctors but i don't you know i knew him firstly as an engineer at signet sound and it was a studio he worked at and so uh i think that's where i came into friendship with brian working on some things with you know and i remember he formed this band agrolytes and uh, you know, he brought it together with the idea of that concept, what he termed dirty reggae, right? And, right? As like a real gritty, you know, yeah. form of reggae that was like Lee Perry and the Upsetters had a lot of real grit to it. And, you know, right. uh, organ driven and like you say, skinhead music, uh, which, you know, seemed to like, I guess it was really produced in the UK. Skinhead reggae really was not something that you 
was a Jamaican product, even though it might have been produced by Jamaican people in the UK or exported to the UK as well, correct? Right. No? So that's where it gets interesting, right? Because when you hear, um, depending on who you're talking to, and I could, I could, I got different stories about this, but yeah. the word skinhead reggae is like, if you try to describe it as a sound, then there's many, many, many songs that came out of Jamaica that can be described as skinhead reggae because it yeah. is a sound. What yeah. happened was um, Jamaican music got repressed in the UK under UK labels. So Palma Records was the was the label, main label, and it had a bunch of subsidiary labels. You had yeah. um, Escort, you had Camel, you had Bullet, you had New Beat, and every single subsidiary label was kind of the um, the stable for different producers out of Jamaica. So, for example, a lot of New Beat stuff had Laurel Aiken on it. Um, a lot of Bamboo stuff had a lot of Studio One on it. Uh, a lot of Bullet stuff had Lee Perry stuff on it. So even though those records were getting pressed in Jamaica under maybe the Upsetter label, when it came to the UK, maybe it, the same song got pressed under the Bullet label. Mm -hmm. But you had these working class dudes, these skinheads, that for, it's a crazy story, right? But like they gravitated towards the music and combine that with Jamaican immigrants coming to the UK at that time, yeah, bringing the ska and blue beat and, and yeah. stuff like that. It was just a, 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 a perfect setup for, for something special. And then you had specific music that was actually created in the UK that was labeled skinhead reggae. And that's where we get to some of the stuff that sounds a little more janky. I like to use the word janky. Sounds a little more loose. You know, you, you know, it sounds like, oh yeah, it was recorded back then, but it doesn't have that same, um, just that same vibe and that same Jamaican swing that, 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 you know, a lot of those tunes have. So that's where you get into um, like, uh, shoot, I'm trying to think of a good example, like Joe, the boss, Joe Monsano, who was a really good producer. Uh, and he had a, a, a label, it's called Joe. It's just, yeah. oh, and it was like a blue label. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff that came off there, Rico did a lot of stuff with him. There's a song called yeah. Rick Cat. And if you listen to the music, it's still, oh, are you kidding me? Like those records are expensive and I love those songs, but it's a little more jankier. It's just a little more stiff. It isn't like yeah. a swinging studio one. Yeah, I remember I had one of those. I had Brixton Cat. I think I sold it to David Orlando for 10 bucks because I didn't think it was worth anything more than that at the time. And it was really clean too, but it was my jam. I mean, it might've been worth 40 bucks at the time, but it was probably worth quite a bit more. <laughs> Right, right, right. But it's about sharing the love. He's one of my best friends. But it's love funny him. because like when I found out it was worth like 80 bucks, that was like certainly like 17, 18 years ago. Like I sold that a couple of years ago for 10 bucks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I also had the Dracula Prince of Darkness record. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, you know, I think we're got we're kind of like getting in a pretty deep dive here because you know, Chris Blackwell was uh, i think they were in the blackwell's family was the, in condiments blackwell mustard blackwell oh. chris blackwell's family was uh made condiments i believe wow he was an entrepreneur he was from an entrepreneurial family he is jamaican right mm -hmm. uh and so i someone told me he was actually importing afro wigs uh wow at, at one point when they were a big commodity like a consumer thing people wore afro wigs i right. don't know how completely true this is but anyways chris blackwell saw the immigration of jamaican and west indian people into england and the uk and he saw that there was a need for distribution of their music for them that wasn't available where they now lived so he went to producers such as Coxone Dodd, for example, and licensed uh, licensed Studio One Coxone label productions for Island or R&B label, right? Uh, I think R&B might have been his own original production, but anyways, to you know, to kind of keep the story flowing. Years later, you would get compilations like the Island Records story, and there would be records that were not produced by Chris Blackwell that were actually, you know, included because they were hits for Island Records itself. So it made sense as the Island Records story compilations and such that 
Cox and Dodd was not happy about that. He, no. he was really not happy about that because back then in the early 60s, he was saying, yeah, sure, I will grant you the licensing to press 45s of this record. He didn't say, no one knew that 10, 12, 20 some years later, this stuff would be like something that would be of historic value and people would want, there would be reissues of it. So, right. you know, the stuff was been reissued again, yet there was no second payment or negotiations. So, you know, there was a lot of rivalry between the, the producers also of Jamaican music. And uh, anyways, you know, Chris Blackwell produced, I think the first hit record for Jamaica though, being uh, Little Sheila. Oh, wow. Little Sheila by Laurel Aitken and Boogie okay. In My Bones. That wow. was R&B label uh, number 102. It was his first production. I think R&B label number 101 was a song that he licensed. Okay. But the second press, the second release on that label was Little Sheila. And that was the Jamaica's first hit, he told me. Wow. And I sat down with him once and, and talked, spoke about that, you know, and chatted with him for a while. So it's just interesting because, you know, the Bob, like he, he actually then so, had the vision and he actually really globalized Bob Marley and the Whalers, right? By right. what, 72 or so after Lee Scratch Perry, 72, 73, he right. brought Bob Marley to a global acclaim and did things like, oh, took the recording to England and added rock guitar on it, which then crossed it over into that would be like FM rock radio accessibility and all these things, right? So, uh, but before that, reggae music sounded significantly different when it started in like 68, 69, 70. I mean, we look at even, even like uh, Jimmy Cliff, uh, Johnny Nash, I could see clearly, you know, uh, was one of our big, I think it was one of the first international hits. Right. Uh, well, the first two international reggae hits were Israelites and Double Barrel by da David Ansel Collins, right? Oh, yeah. Israelites by uh, Desmond Decker and Double Barrel right. by David Ansel Collins, both in 1969. They, they made actually like global and US airplay as this is like when people weren't thinking of it as a, it's a different genre than rock. It was a pop song. It was right. back when we had instrumentals commonly in pop music. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have things like a mother child reunion by Paul Simon, oh, which is great. the same band, right? As the, as, as the Jim, as the Johnny Nash band, yeah. right? Same band, which is the, um, it was at Dynamic Studios and Leslie Kong, and it's the Beverly All Stars, right? So the Beverly All Stars, sure, the musicians would would kind of filter through a, a certain group of guys, right? So maybe you had, um, a, you know, one guitar player different differential, but it was pretty much the same group of guys that had that sound, and that's a lot of the stuff that came from a lot of Toots and the Maytel stuff, Sweet and Dandy, uh, came out of that studio. A lot of um, a, a gay lad stuff came out of that stuff. It has a specific sound. The guitar has this real picky, like almost like wah wah, like sound. Uh -huh. A caution. Yeah. A lot of the Bob Marley had a certain era of songs that came out of there. Songs like Caution, uh, Soul Shakedown, Do It Twice, Back Out. That whole era. Um, Was that the things that uh, Johnny Nash produced on the JAD label? I'm not quite sure. I know that Johnny Nash and Bob definitely they have that connection there. Yeah. Uh -huh. and Johnny Nash and um yeah, the Paul Simon went to that studio. Yeah. So what song? year was that song? Around 72 or something? Yeah, just I was a kid. I remember it on the radio. Just based on the sound of Mother Child Reunion, I would say because it still has that that kind of I'll call it skinned reggae kind of like yeah, a it has that up thing, right? Right, right. Yeah. I would say, yeah, shoot, 70, 71, and that's pushing it, you yeah. know, because yeah. that whole thing happened really quick. I mean, if you look at 68, maybe the, the back end of 68 into 69, you could you could confidently say 1969 had that those characteristics in the music. 
but then it kind of pushed over the 70, but by 71, things were already changing, you know, like you talk about Trojan records and them trying to implement, um, everybody always had on their head, like, how do we make this pop? So, you know, they were implementing strings and, you know, more horns and a lot of stuff was sounding cheese ball, you know? Yeah. Well, um, this brings point. me to a question like, well, first of all, like me and no one else when that song during the seventies, mother child reunion, I never thought twice as it being not an American song or sounding exotic. It just was a cool song. It was a good song. It wasn't reggae. It was just a cool song. It wasn't until years later, someone pointed it out to me that that's a reggae song. And that they told me that it was the Johnny Nash's were the same people from, you know, I could see clearly now. And, and what was the other one that Johnny Nash had? Oh, hold me tight. Hold, hold me tight. tight. Yeah, hold me tight. Steer it up, right? right. Which was like once again, steer it, steer it up was like another American hit record. And it was years before I ever heard of Bob Marley. Oh my right. gosh! Even I shot the sheriff by Eric Clapton was a huge hit. And like kids like me, we didn't know who Bob Marley was. It wasn't until some years later that I finally heard that on the radio somewhere. I mean, I, I found out about Bob Marley, but right. he was like, oh, this must be the original version. <laughs> right, right. You you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's so interesting. So what was it? I mean, how about we give context to people that maybe uh, don't know so much about this that are watching, you know, mm -hmm. the what are what's a skinhead the skinhead is a person in england is a like a blue collar worker who would shave their head a rough neck person right i mean right. i i was told that like skinheads really were nationalists mean right. people that would just have any excuse to really like be violent with people uh for no no uh provocation necessarily and not just uh, people of color could be just right. innocent, normal white person that they're just picking on for something to do, like soccer hooligans, right? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, what is it that made so they? But the context is like there was a lot of immigration, right? There was a lot of immigration from people that were from Jamaica, but also uh, from Pakistan, Pakistan and places. Yeah. So like there weren't enough jobs to go around. So people would move to UK from different places and they would get a job. Well, then the nationalist person would be up in arms because now they who have been living there uh, as Saxons and Normans going back to the Crusades, if you will, now there's not enough jobs for the people that are already there, right? Isn't that where the racial tension came, comes in? Well, I think, and, and you know, I always encourage people wh whenever I'm talking about like, you know, skinhead reggae and, and having people understand, okay, original skinheads had nothing to do with racism. I always encourage people to just go to Wikipedia. We, we live in a day now where people would be very, very surprised because anybody, I mean, you know, nine out of 10 people, they're going to be like, oh, skinhead. Yeah, the racist, you know, Hitler, Nazi, whatever. But yeah. that's the authority, you know, do the research online. My My whole take of it is that Yes, you had, you know, before it got to a point where the National Front kind of ad adapted that look like they kind of, you know, because it's a it's a menacing look, you know. Um, and so there was a point where they kind of recruited, you know, the youth and that look. And then that became the poster for racism, skinhead, you know, when, when so you start it was appropriated. Oh, but for sure. The for National sure. Front, for those who don't know, was an organization of nationalists. So. So it got appropriated from people who just had this look of like bomber jackets and Doc Martin boots and, and things but like also, this. But also take that even out of the equation. Yes, you had the tense uh, vibe of what you just described earlier about you know people's jobs being at stake. And so besides even the National Front coming in there, just in general, you had the animosity of people and people. You know what I mean? So even take uh, reggae music out of it and, and, and you just look at... Um, a certain subculture that's looking a certain way, you're going to have those 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 uh, racial tensions just by default because 
they feel threatened that jobs are being taken away or you're different than me. So that's going to happen regardless with any subculture. And I think that got highlighted even more so with the skinhead look. And especially since, you know, you throw national front in there and then you have yourself a whole almost like pre-written story without even thinking about it. You're just like, Oh, the skinhead's always been racist. The skinhead's always been, but when people trip out and they go, no original skinheads had nothing to do with it. Far from it. You know, they were, um, Max Romeo tells a story, I think it might be somewhere on YouTube, but he tells a story, you know, because he had a big hit called Wet Dream. Uh, total 1969 yeah. song, a perfect description of that, that, uh, that era. And he remembers playing a live show over there and, and people were giving him some, some story along the lines of he had to walk back to his hotel or something. And I think the average Joe, someone, someone, someone there was giving him trouble and skinheads were like, escorting him to the hotel or escort and pretty much being his safety, you know, bodyguard crew. Mm -hmm. So they, it was very opposite. It was like, you know, they were listening to this music. They adored these musicians, you know, black musicians, they had adored black culture. And for a lot of them, it was very near and dear to their heart. So it was quite the opposite of, of any hatred or any um, kind of bias towards them. It was like, they were the heroes, you know, the Derek uh -huh. of the world, the, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it's so a, the story gets more got morphed as time went on. In other words, it's like, to, yeah. So it's it's really good that you encourage everyone to go to Wikipedia and look up skinheads. I mean, and and see what that was all about because you know that was like a pocket of time. Let's talk a moment about this. The skinhead reggae only lasted a couple of years. So, and you kind of touched on it. And this is something I don't really know a lot about myself, but like, why was it short lived? Was it also because people just kind of got tired of the sound and style of it and wanted to change up the style? What was um, it? Well, you know what it is? It's like, it's like any kind of shift in the eras of Jamaican music. Um, you know, Ska, you had, you had more years than Rocksteady and then Rocksteady probably lived more years than that skinhead reggae thing. But one, one cool thing that I've learned over the years by talking to different people around the world, because of course we're in our own bubble here in Los Angeles. And when you grow up in the subculture, you, use the, you, you have a certain perception of how things went. But one good example of how I, how I could gauge how other people looked at the skinhead reggae era and term was the Agrolites were fortunate enough to do a tour with Madness, the two-tone band Madness. And we did this tour, it was about a two week tour, um, still early in our careers. And uh, Jerry Dahmers, the creator, pretty much the creator of Two Tone. I mean, he's the was the leader and creator of the specials, and kind of was the the mastermind behind behind that whole movement. Um, he was the DJ for that tour, so it went him DJing, Agrolites play. He DJs again, Madness plays. What a great two weeks! Wow, because he's a really big hero of mine. It still is, um, as a keyboard player as well. You know, because I'm over here, he's playing vintage organs, all that stuff. So you could, you could imagine during the course of that two week tour, I'm like, you know, in his dressing room, we're trying to like talk to him and chill. And he would always say, you know, we're one of the, you know, you know Agrolite's one of the best rock steady bands. But my point is, is he would never say like skinhead reggae. He would never even say reggae. It would always be rock steady. Even though it was very, very clear, we weren't playing what you or me think is rock steady, more of a slower, groovier uh, uh, beat. So a lot of people, in Jamaica, even, are you kidding me? They never used the term skinhead reggae. I mean, the 69, 70, it was still being labeled as rock steady, you know? Really? Um, yeah, oh, for sure. And, you know, I have this um, show I do with my, my, my co host, Devin Morrison, called the Reggae Pod Clash. And what we like to do is play records. And we like to play records. Um, there's been quite a few of them that we've played where it kind of highlights the shift from rock steady to, to skinhead reggae or that mm -hmm. era of reggae. Yeah. And you notice that it starts with the hi-hat, you know, the hi-hat starts speeding up. Yeah. But yet everything else still stays rock steady. And a lot of the pioneer stuff um, was like that. It was this shift. And then slowly after that, the organ started having a shuffle, you know, yeah, it's playing faster, faster, uh, upbeats, right? More frequent, right? Right. Everything kind of followed the drum hi-hat pattern from my perspective, at least. I and see. So, and so you, you you got to see, and certain songs really highlight the shift, and I love it because 
you know, the older I get, the more geekier I get, like where I'm just like, I, I look at songs, of course, the groove of it, and I adore these songs, but I, I hear them different as you, as I get older. I'm like, okay, cool, this makes yeah. sense. This was a, a certain label or um, studio that had this sound, and they were kind of uh, uh, the ones who shifted, you know, that sound. So now you have the Joe Gibbs amalgamated label, where a lot of the stuff on that label was just like I described. It was the shift from rock steady to like early reggae. I and then of course, like anything, once something becomes popular on the island, all the other studios start, you know, yes. doing so. Right. Yeah. They all need to figure out how the, the other person got success and steal right. it, and steal the idea or jump on the bandwagon and see right, what they right. do with it. You know, I remember like uh, Lion of Judah was a song that was uh, an immense hit for Delroy Wilson as mm -hmm. a like 12 year old kid. Right. He was right. from a church background. It's a hymn. And uh, I believe that Laurel Aitken was recording that. Okay. And one of Cox and Dodd's spies was in that studio and went and reported back to him that they were recording Lion of Judah. And so they had Delroy Wilson go in and record it so they could put it out before. Oh, I don't no. Know. And that's what happened. Yep, and I know that I have a copy of Lion of Judah by Laurel Aiken on the Black Swan label, which that's that's a Chris Blackwell United Kingdom pressing, but I don't know what if that was the original release label or what. Right. I don't know. Do you know? I don't. I do not yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, just for instance, there were always spies. Even before oh. the Jamaicans were producing, when they were just DJing records, oh, yeah. there oh, were right. spies at the dances to report back to the other DJ like, you got to go get this record. It's called this by this artist, and they would scratch the labels off so they they couldn't do this, right? Right. The DJs would would get in the habit of doing that because it was a. I mean, the competition. It's a whole game that we know nothing about, right? Because like you, you you nailed it. There's this well, yeah high competition at that point of of Huge. not only not only dance halls and sound systems because that was one thing. Which sound system had the best tunes? The latest yeah. tunes. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but, but now what's the relationship between the sound systems and you know uh, the, the the companies, the studios that are pressing the records? Like, how does that work? You know, do I gotta like you know grease your palms a little bit to get the latest? Like, who knows what kind of uh, uh, deals were going on because it was their livelihood. It was like you know, and then even deeper, the musicians like how where does the loyalty stand? You know, musicians got to make money, but at the same time, a lot of these studios were very proud of them having their house band and their stable of musicians you know yeah. so, uh, and a I, lot of them jump from stable to stable you know right. uh it's interesting tell tell us once again the name of your podcast and give us a little bit of des description about it and where yeah. where, where we could find it and give us some details so the podcast is called the reggae pod clash and uh you can find it on at the reggaepodclash.com uh currently and you go on YouTube and type in Reggae Pod Clash. Anywhere that you get podcasts, you can you can find it. Type in Reggae Pod Clash. We've uh, we have a, we do a good job. Uh, we're under Rootfire.net, and they do a good job of dispersing the pod clashes so they're uploaded like in a timely manner. We do it. We used to do it every Saturday because um, this started out of the quarantine era, mm -hmm. and now I'd say in the past couple months, now we've done, we're doing it by you know biweekly where it's just couple times a month, but it gets uploaded. Shoot, I'd say, you know, that Tuesday, we do it on the Saturday, probably that Tuesday or Wednesday. But essentially what it is, is it, I mean, it started off as something to do. Me and Devin Morrison, uh, he was in a band called The Expanders and he's a great artist in his own right. But we uh, had this idea of doing a podcast even way before, I mean, in 2019, and we've always been busy. So there's been nothing to really kick us in a gear. And lo and behold, you know, the quarantine comes up and it's kind of an opportunity to, to, to do it. And so it started off with um, the mission statement being, look, we have our, we have one foot in the modern reggae world, what's labeled as a Cali roots world. A lot of these modern bands that don't really, their fan base is their fan base, you know, and um, not yeah. a lot of them are educated about old school reggae. If anything, they know Bob Marley and I know, uh, you know, maybe Dennis Brown or like a yeah. yellow man, but you throw them, you tell them out in Alice or anything and they go, who? So the mission statement was, 
you know, and obviously me and Devin were, have been in the, the purest scene for a while, uh, old school Jamaican appreciation, just, you know, since yeah. we are listening to this music. So that was the mission statement is to kind of, you know, introduce and, and, and kind of grab both hands and, and let them shake. So it started off with doing interviews from modern artists, um, uh, modern artists in the Cali root scene, and then old school artists, um, foundation artists out of Jamaica. But it's kind of shifted, um, especially since the passing of Two Tibbert, for us to really, really, really concentrate on gathering uh, interviews and sit downs with, with original foundation Jamaican artists. Because when you really sit back and uh, look at it, for example, we have Mr. Derek Morgan on the show, uh, not this Saturday, but next, next Saturday. And Derek Morgan, geez, you know, it's just someone who is there from the foundation of ska music through every era, someone who, you know, a forward march, his song was the song like the, 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 the talked about Jamaican independence. So like at that moment, Jamaica has independence going all the way to him creating, you know, a moon hop, which was the, the song that then, uh, moved on to Skinhead Moonstomp with Roy Alice and Simrip. Right. And so he's and rougher than rough. Yeah. Tough than rough. That's a, a huge song that, that started the rock yeah. movement. Yeah, no, he's huge. I mean, and like talking about, yeah, uh, Forward March, we're talking about 1964 when Jamaica gained its independence from England. And he, like, he was before then, I believe, 59 even, starting when they were playing like Shuffle Boogie and American rhythm and blues that's later labeled as blue beat Scott. Right. So he uh, also is responsible for taking Bob Marley over to Miss Beverly, who had a recording studio be in, in behind her ice cream store, right? Beverly's was an ice cream store. He brought Bob Marley in there to make his very first single Right? Is it Robert Martell? I believe under the name Robert Martell. Oh, One I'm, cup of coffee. One cup of coffee, yeah. And the other side was. Uh, um, oh, judge I, not, no, judge, judge not. not, judge not. Yeah. So like this, Derek Morgan. Who knows what would have happened had he not done that? Would we have never had Bob Marley? Right. Would he, exactly. Would the world never have reggae? Like, like, would the turn of events never have happened? That's crazy. If not for Derek Morgan. So you have Derek Morgan coming in for an interview. And so that's what I'm saying. It's so weird. Because it's so beautiful because that's when our, our, our goals kind of shifted. It was like, look, in 10 years, I mean, we, we want all these artists to live forever, but in 10 yeah. years, you look back and go, yeah. how many more artists do we have with us that were around the ska era? It's something that we take for granted over the years. I mean, it's, it's, it's like... Sure. You yeah. yourself, look at, I look at people like someone who's a real near, was a really good friend of yours, but like Roland Alfonso, for me, I never, uh, I was, his, one of his last shows he played live, like I wasn't old enough to get into the clubs. Oh, wow. So I, could, I couldn't even see him live. I mean, I knew of him, yeah. obviously, but being a, a fan, a little rude boy back when I was small, but, but not like you can't fathom some of these people like Jackie Matu or Tommy McCook. I'm like, they're just imaginary yeah. sometimes, you know? And so, yeah. Um, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And so many of them passed even before the eighties or by the eighties, but before there was a resurgence in like interest enough to bring them to the States or different places outside of Jamaica or England where they resided. Right. So, you know, Fortunately, like a lot of it did happen, especially by the 90s right. uh, with people like Eric Kohler and, and Junior Francis facilitating a lot of those Ska Bonanza shows and, you know, and, and people like Ken Booth, for example. I mean, you know, think people that we wouldn't have maybe, uh, I was not immersed in the reggae scene of Southern California. So I'm not that keyed into who was coming out here in the 80s, but uh, I'm sure there was a lot, you know, uh, Delroy Wilson probably, but, uh, you know, geez, I, I remember th th seeing, I think, Derek, uh, Desmond Decker at the Whiskey, and uh, right? Were you at the show? You know, I was uh, and I, at the Knitting Factory. And I, I see, and I think, I believe that, uh, 
Delroy Wilson was his backup singer. Oh. And I didn't even know it. And he wasn't even really introduced. It was just the guy up there singing the other part. Right, right. I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable. But, uh, you know, it's really good that you're doing this because, yeah, there is another generation of people here that, you know, nobody is born knowing. Let's just start there, you know. Uh, Mo, how often does you, you, your parent, has your parent said, oh, you don't know who they are? Yeah, they were before your time. Because we don't know who an actor was from before we were born, an actor, a musician, an author, you know, a lot of, a lot of culture wasn't from our time. So we, we're looking at what's happening while we're growing up. It's just what happens. So, you know, our generation was also like, kind of niche because we weren't like most kids of our age were not finding and looking and searching for this culture it just was what we found ourselves in it and it found us but now there's another generation who's younger than us that's listening to a new kind of reggae and jamaican influenced music Right. And they're just not aware that there was stuff before, because to them, it's kind of like hearing, oh, what's the new rock band? Right. You know, oh, I'm listening to, I'm going to listen to like, I'm going to use a bad example because it's already like so old, but I'm going to listen to Smashing Pumpkins. Oh, no, I don't know who Led Zeppelin is uh, you know, or whatever. You, right. It's right. hard. It's not a great example, but like, I don't know. I've never listened to Elvis. You know, I've only listened to uh, Nirvana or whatever the thing is. You just, right. that's how it is. So you're providing things that will give people clues. The, just the kind of people that will going to like fall in love with it. The people that want to like, they're going to go, well, what is that? Oh, I want to look into that. And they're like, they're going to. They're just going to have this treasure chest open up for them. That's just going to like make their head explode, right? And it, it's we, really timely that you're doing this, you know, we, especially you know, now. We were all there, you know, when, when we make the shift, when we discover old school Jamaican music. For yeah. me, it was through two-tone music. So to, 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 just, to find out that all these songs that the specials are playing on their self-titled album, the majority of them are covers, you know, being able to go and wait a minute, this is another monkey man. This is another... Uh, uh, you know, gangsters or, yeah, or they deliver it so well that you also, first of all, you didn't know. And second of all, whichever order you want to say, like they deliver it with their own conviction that you just take for granted that, oh, it's the specials. They wrote this song, right? I mean, I, right, exactly. I didn't know. I mean, that was my foray. It was, it was, you know, a, a message to you, Rudy, uh, with Rico. Who's this guy, Rico? Yeah, he's really cool. Rico uh, didn't know that, like, till years later that he was the trombone player who played on the original recording by Danny Livingston, right, right. of right. that song. And to this day, a lot of people don't even know that, that there was a first version of that. It's it's incredible, really incredible. And that was my, also my foray was like, I heard that special's first album. And it was like, wow, this is, I, I love the energy. I just love how inspired and I love the vibe of it, how happy it is. Right. Um, I didn't even know it was Jamaican. I just, ska, what's ska? I have no context nope. of where it came from any of it and because one of the reasons why is i didn't know any british people yet and i was 17 when i first heard that album in 1980 wow and, yeah and so i taped it from a friend and it wouldn't be until about 1984 that i was sat down by jason mail whose mm -hmm. brother is gaz mail okay yeah. jason mail British guys, they lived where there was that music. We didn't have it distributed to Los Angeles. Right. It wasn't something that was in demand enough to be distributed to where we lived. Maybe in an international record shop, maybe as right. a few items, but not the amount of music that was produced back then. And Jason Mayall sat me down and started playing these records from Studio One and 
Nice. You know, showed me the first recordings of the Whalers at Studio One and the Scatolites and yeah. the first like what what is dub reggae, you know, and Black Uhuru with Michael Rose, like dub versions and all kinds of great stuff just opened me up to it, you know. Um, that's kind of where it happened. I mean, yeah, I wasn't, we didn't have the music here. How would we know? There was no internet. There was no internet, no. Oh. That would have, see, that would have, that would have changed the Joey Altruda timeline if you didn't have a, <laughs> a Jason in your life. Oh, I know, because you see, Jason and Gaz, their father is John Mayall of the famous John Mayall blues. blues Breakers, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He really started the British blues revival. I, I think he actually introduced the Rolling Stones to each other, if I'm correct. But anyway, you know, uh, Jason lived in LA for a long time. And, uh, you know, we were friends. And my girlfriend at the time was one of his roommates. So I was always there, you know. And so I got exposed to so much music. And this was right when Gaz Mayall, see, Gaz Mayall was buying records uh jamaican 45s of ska and rock steady at the local flea markets on portobello road in england for like five pounds for a whole stack of 45s and a lot okay. of time they were really scratchy because they were enjoyed they were played at parties and like people weren't thinking of these as someday they're going to be rare and worth a lot of money there was this consumer item which right which is what makes the records valuable because a lot of them were played deaf or a lot of them were, uh, you know, not preserved in good condition. So the ones that are in great condition are worth a lot of money, right. but you know, they were uh, expendable items. So, uh, but Gaz was making tapes of these records, cassette tapes that he was then duplicating and selling at his little Thursday night club, which has been going for 40 years now, by the way, Gaz is rock and blues, but oh my I God. remember like Jason coming back from a trip to England with the first Gaz cassettes of like, and this was stuff that was not found on reissue albums. No Maybe way. two songs out of a 90 minute tape would have been on something you might find as a reissue at one of the Melrose record shops, but he right. still wasn't until the late eighties that the Melrose record shops began carrying a lot of that music right, or, right. or even some of it. But it's just so interesting because, wow. I mean, the things I got to hear and yeah, there was no internet, there was no YouTube. Now it's like, here, have every record that was ever recorded at your fingertips. Oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a uh, yeah, these kids are lucky, trust me. Every record, yeah, right there in front of you. Gee whiz. They're lucky, but they also have to like figure out like, well, what should I be looking for? That's, yeah. that's right, too, because you get so much in front of you. It's like, you know, when we didn't have that, it kind of the story naturally took place. You know, you kind of you moved from from one band to another band, but it came, it was in an organic way. Whereas now it's like, all right, here's a million songs. Where do you start? And now you got yeah. You know, yeah, it's it's a different ball game, and you know, uh, it also made it gave us like in a way because of the limitations of you could only make cassette tapes from records your friends own or right. duplicate the tape from a friend because like those records were so rare, right? So like you devoured that tape. You listened to it in your car. You took it to parties. You listen to that tape until you owned every note on every song, like you really digested the music. So because the limitations of quantity, you really came to an intimate place in knowing the music more so than like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to listen to this one a couple times. Oh, it's killer. But let me go move over to that one and listen right. to that one a couple times. You didn't sit there and listen to it over and over and over. Right. Right. You're right. You nailed it. I mean, you had what the, the same five or ten tapes that would be in yeah. your car even before CDs, you know? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that one album and it, and it would, yeah. it would remind you of a certain and yeah. now it's nostalgic. Where now on Spotify, all right, 
next, 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 next. Yeah. And, you know, CDs really did open up a lot more availability, huge amounts of music that was otherwise not available. Right. Maybe, maybe some of it had been reissued on the LPs by the 70s, but even that LP was no longer available for a long time. So uh, Heartbeat Records really did an incredible job of making so much of like the creme de la creme uh, available for us. Yeah. And uh, yeah, now with Spotify, <laughs> I don't even use Spotify actually, not to knock it. I just, I just, <laughs> I guess I got too much other stuff to pay attention to right now. And uh, let's talk about Tom Zay for a minute. Oh, let's do this because ladies and gentlemen and everyone else, them, those, everybody, everyone's included in this conversation everyone everyone love everyone here thank you for tuning in and if you don't know who tom zay is are you in for a treat uh, tom zay is a brazilian musician a certifiable genius in in his thinking and his intellect and the way he puts music together he has been recording albums since 1967 and he was part of really what sparked off the Tropicalia movement in Brazil uh, of the late 60s, which contained, uh, you know, Caetano Veloso and, and Gilberto Gil and Gal Costa, Novos Baianos, uh, Jorge Macalé. Uh, Tom Zay is the, a little bit older than they, they are. He's 84 now, and they've always, like, looked up to him, like, you're, you're our guy. You're, like, you're our big, big inspiration. And these people are geniuses and prophetic in what they do. Um, so Tom Zay, you know, he, he had a career. There was a military dictatorship in Brazil that lasted over 20 years from the early 60s to like the almost the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. And these artists making the Tropicalia music in the late 60s, early 70s, they were, they were people that were really hassled by uh, the government, in fact, Caetano Veloso and Gilberto Gil had to, they, they had to leave the country. They were arrested for subversion. They wow. were, you know, lived in, in uh, exile in England for a couple of years, you know, and like Tom Zay at, at one point by, I think maybe the late seventies or so, I can't remember he stopped making records. He really went underground, okay? Uh, because he did not want to be hassled by uh, the, the government for, you know, being hippies and being, you know, having lyrics that had double meanings that were like speaking out against the government, but they were so, so poetic that they were, all of those meanings were hidden within the poetry, you know? Right, and the right, way right. he manipulates music, uh, he's a trained composer and arranger. Uh, he's just an incredible guy. I mean, some people here would liken him to say being Brazil's Captain Beefheart, but like, honestly, it's just so far beyond that. But right. like, as far as the fun and zaniness and originality of Captain Beefheart, I get that, but this guy's like a, classically trained musician and trained in uh, like understands all the, the rhythm rhythms of Brazil and what he did was like he's able to mess with rhythm in such an incredible way and you know he was dormant for a long time and somehow David Byrne discovered his music during a trip to Brazil and brought brought this record back from the seventies and he freaked out and he f went and found Tom Zay and he wow. went on to like show Tom Zay to the whole world and really um, he showed into the world, he got his music reissued and compiled and started producing new records by him. And, you know, there's documentaries on him. He's toured the world. It sub you know, like as a result of it. And so uh, in the past couple of years, I, I came into an acquaintance uh, with Tom Zay and we decided to uh, work on a record together to make, to make a song together. 
collaborate on a, a song of his that I really loved from one of his early albums and make a ska version of it. So I called upon Roger. Yeah. And I, and I Tom sent me his voice parts. And uh, I, we were able to operate through the internet. This is not new to me. I've been operating remotely, producing remotely for a long time. So, you know, I, I got Roger to put the keyboard part on yeah. and uh, Oliver Charles put the drums on. If you don't know Oliver Charles from Ben Harper's band and Gogo Bordello, but also Ocean Eleven. And what was the other band in the ska scene before that he was from? Oh, man. I, I I don't know the whole history, but like he's an extraordinary drummer. And, you know, then we got Artie Webb from, you know, Ray Barreto's band, uh, who I played with for years, who plays flute. He's a legend in his own in his own right. Uh, Marlon Sechi from Brazil, who's a trombone player, ex extraordinaire. Uh, anyone I'm leaving out. Uh, anyway, oh, Victor Rice, right, yeah. okay, is now going to be mixing this. So we're going to release this track. It's called Ababa. It means the nanny. And uh, it's sung in Brazilian. It's traditional ska, but then we also made a steppers reggae version of this. So this one's going to be put out, planning on digitally releasing this on February 14th, Valentine's yeah. Day. And then we will, I will be creating a wait list for anybody who wants to buy a 45 of this, creating a wait list and uh, bringing together uh, enough people then to go forth to make the pressing of an exclusive, like limited edition 45 of this. So this is big, right? Because it's like a, it's like a dream team we've got going here. It's such an original it's, concept. It's, it's, it's so crazy. I mean, and when you mentioned 45, I mean, as a collector, uh, it's it's just, you don't get many genres that cross like this. And when you do, you know, a lot of times it's at risk, it's, it's either at risk of being cheesy or it hurts. But man, I mean, hearing the song and how good it is and how everyone came to the table with like their A game, it just sounds phenomenal. And I can only wait, you know, until Victor gets his hands on it, but I mean, people of uh, fans of, of tom fans of jamaican music like this is a no-brainer and i love the fact that you say you know the special limited edition on the vinyl because like uh, once again as a collector this is something that you you get you pre-order and you're gonna have this in your stack you're gonna be looking back at this years and going oh yeah you know because sometimes things are released and immediately they're they're rare you know uh -huh. Especially the quantity. I mean, I, you know, I, I keep my ear to that to that floor all the time. So when you know the pre order comes out, it's like do yourselves a favor. I mean, and and Joey, they're they're going to be able to be um, informed, right? Like when the pre order comes out. Yeah, yeah. Everyone should go visit my website, regardless, JoeyAltruda.com, and we will be putting a page up there. Go and check the site out because there's a lot of information about me and what I'm doing, right. my history, but also what I'm currently doing and other projects I'm involved with. But that will be where the 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 opt in is to like sign in you could actually go there right now and get a 40 minute mega mix of uh music that i produced wow. uh, as a dj mix for free just for opting in and being on my email list and then being informed through emails of what i'm up to but i will be also putting a special little capture page of like here's how to get on the list for that tom zay mm -hmm. uh release for the 45 and uh it is it is something greatly special to me because i i really cherish tom zay and it's a it's an honor to like it's a miracle like first of all like it's for him to like say yes to this and that we have the technology to he's in he's in sao paulo brazil we have the technology How for him to send me like record in his house send me the track i send it to you i send it you know i send it to oliver right. i mean Honestly, like, and, and then send it back to Sao Paulo where Victor Rice is. If you don't know who Victor Rice is, like, he played bass on Dub Side of the Moon. He was in the Slackers, right? The Slackers, uh, a lot of East Coast bands, the Scoff Laws. Um, yeah. He's just one of those guys on the Mount Rushmore of, of East Coast ska music, Jamaican yeah. music. And yeah. And since moving to Brazil, he has 
his resume of, of music that he's been doing over there is just phenomenal as well. All yeah. the music over there. So it's really like a dream team that yeah. you've constructed here, Joey. And, yeah. and, and it's like there's, it's just set up for this real piece, uh, real awesome piece of art and music. I mean, something that, that, that surpasses the, the individuals that, that are in the band, but even Tom, but the actual story behind it, the fact that how, how, you know, how old he is right now and that he hasn't been doing music for a while. And then now it's being incorporated with Jamaican music. It's one of those songs and, and, and records that's going to be um, written about in magazines. And, and let's talk. hope so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, you know, hopefully I'll be able to come out over on, on your sound clash and give you a preview of it at oh, some yeah. point, you know, and, and have a chat about that. I mean, it is exciting. Everyone should also go to Victor Rice's YouTube channel because it, there's videos of him doing dubbed versions and stuff. Have you seen this? Beautiful it, stuff, man. Right? He's one of those guys. I mean, I, you know, I'm over here, you know, getting my dub chops up. But he's one of those guys that have, has been doing, has been the art of dub. It's an art, you know. He as a, as a as a dub engineer, you are a musician, and he has been sharpening his tools for years. So he's been ahead of the game. Yes, his sessions are great. It's just like he's creating magic on the spot. Yeah, and so, you know, it's it's great to work with him. And really, this is the, the vision here is to do this with more and more artists. Like, this is the first first one. Let's make a whole series of this. So let's get and then make albums and such. But uh, it is an honor. He's actually going to make uh, videos of him dubbing these versions out, too, that will be posted here oh, on wow on the channel so uh comment like share the channel here please i'm i'm getting it out there right now i appreciate it joeyaltruda.com is the website uh roger once again give us the info for your your reggae pod clash the reggae pod clash go to rootfire.net slash tv and you'll see all of our you just go to any place you get your podcasts whether that's, you know, Apple uh, Podcasts or Spotify Podcast, type in Reggae Podclash and you'll see our whole archive. I think we're on our episode uh, 25 now. So it's really, really crazy. Oh. So many original foundation artists. Um, we play so many uh, cool 45s and talk about them in depth. So yeah, go check that out. We're really- Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you, Roger. Was there any more, one more question if you have one about me that you- <laughs> I wow, yeah. it <laughs> we could have a whole segment where we flip. Maybe, um, wow. Maybe we I, should do a, a different. I, I, I love, you know, I always, before I even knew you as a person, I mean, knew you in, in person, seeing footage of you have, you know, Roland Alfonso as your guest and playing with Jump with Joey. Um, yeah, I guess my question would be like, what? Can you give us something cool, some cool story, some cool exchange, some cool something uh, with you and Roland? Because when he would play with, with Jump with Joey, the band was already magic. But to have someone, an original Scottalite, sit in with a band that already did the original Jamaican sound better than anyone, who at a time, ska was just a million miles an hour, and it, was, it, it didn't make sense. But yeah. Jump with Joey was really... You could tell they were influenced by original Jamaican music. So to have Roland Alfonso come in and sit in with you guys, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but was it like Skaba? Were you, were you guys doing Skaba, the song Skaba? Or yeah. Like, bum, bum, yeah. Yeah. Bum, uh -huh. That was insane, man. I saw some footage of that. And That's that with Angelo Moore playing baritone sax on that on, on YouTube. If you look up Jump with Joey Skaba, that was, I think, the first time Roland came and played with us. And Roland, we had prepared a bunch of tunes of Scatolites uh, so that we could play his repertoire. And he came to the sound check and he just was, he honestly, he was just blown away because he could just sit, relax and play. And we knew all his tunes and there were no problems. And there was like, he didn't have to direct. He didn't have to school us and like, now you're doing this wrong. You got to do it this way. There was nothing. It was like, let's go and like the thing about Roland was like I had a very close close friendship with him and um he had had two strokes before I had met him mm. uh and you know at this time like he only had uh use of one hand and partial use of another hand 
and this and like he had a very strange issues with his memory because he couldn't like for example he might not be able to remember what he ate for dinner an hour ago or oh. sometimes he would ask you what what city are we in because he traveled so much on tour and things you oh. know uh, because of the stroke but like you'd get him on one of those songs and it'd be time for his solo and even on the obscure songs, not the hits, but the obscure ones, he would play the solo verbatim of what wow. he played on the record. Wow. Like, okay, like 35 years before or whatever, 40 years before he'd play it verbatim. And then he would continue on with like a, another course of like something fresh that he was improvising right now. But like the way his mind was wired was phenomenal. Um, you know, I... I asked him a lot about Don Drummond. Um, I remember once asking, was it you know, like, was Don Drummond conceited? I don't know why I asked him. It was something to do with the conversation. Hey, no, Don wasn't conceited, you know, but he had a funny story that like Don Drummond, uh, if you were taking a solo on like in Scatolites and you were blowing your solo and like you took, you took a moment to like, pause before you continued on he'd jump in there and steal the rest of your solo and take it away <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know oh. and you know they said like you know i mean roland alfonso was his 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 soloing was so lyrical mm -hmm. that you know uh cox and dodd it was told me you know well roland introduced me to cox and dodd I wow. thought Cox and Dodd had been gone for years for some reason because the music sounds so archaic and you wow. never really hear, heard people talking about Cox and Dodd in present tense, the producer of all the original Studio One records. But one day I was in Brooklyn and I, I asked Roland, you know, whatever happened to Cox and Dodd? And he said, oh, he's in the back of the, of the Coxon's Music City. They, they have a recording studio in, behind the shop. Right. He's over there. He, I'm like, what do you mean there's a studio? I'd been shopping for records there. Anytime I would visit New York, I'd go to Cox right. Music City and buy re reissues of like the Cox and Studio One things, right? That I couldn't get in LA. Right. And didn't I, I didn't know that these ladies that were waiting on me every time was his wife and his daughter, Carol. Right. I'm like, what? Crazy. And then like, yeah, so Roland, you want me to bring you over there? And, like we went, went over there and that's where we made friends, you know? And wow. one thing Coxon was saying, like Roland was so lyrical, like songs, like I'm in a dancing mood. Oh yeah. They played yeah. alto and he goes, -da 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 right? Okay, it's a famous solo. He, like they said when, 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 when uh, Roland would play without, uh, who is it? Is it Tommy? Al huh? Tommy? Tommy McClure? Uh, who's saying I'm in a dancing mood? Del oh, uh, Delroy Wilson Del saying. Delroy Wilson, yeah. yeah. Whatever, like whoever he was playing with that he had recorded with, though, like, for example, Delroy Wilson, when it would come time for that solo, he would play that solo live and mm -hmm. the entire audience would sing it along with him because they it. knew it because it was so, so touching. So that's that's my little Roland Alfonso anecdote for you. Right. and. Uh, we'll have to do another session like this. It's it's super fun. I, I really enjoy it. And Me we've too, been man. going here for a while and don't want to waste, uh, wear out the audience here. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in. There will be a follow up for this for sure. And uh, thank you so much, Roger. And like, uh, like I say, like, comment and share. All right. Uh, till then. Ciao for now. I see you on the flip side, baby. Okay. I love it. Stopped recording. No. Hey, I got to edit that now. Stop.